I'll briefly uh, summarize, you know, that uh, instability, uh, the treatment of instability depends on what's causing the instability. And so uh, children's stability is, is, is uh, highly uh, variable in the spectrum of it. So in both in degree and direction and their contributing factors, including capsular laxity, uh, labral uh, tears of, of, of multiple varieties and then bony insufficiency. And that includes both the glenoid and the humeral head that can all contribute. And, and importantly, uh, what you find it, it's very rare to find these lesions in an isolated fashion. So very often you're dealing with a patient who's got little of this and little of that. So in 2007, uh, Dr. Boileau put out a study in what he called the ISIS score, which now is a somewhat unfortunate name, but uh, instability severity in index score. This was uh, what they looked at as their success rate with arthroscopic bank heart repair. And they found that they had an unacceptably high redislocation rate, you know, 14 and percent. And so they looked at all those patients who failed and then tried to categorize what were the risk factors that led to the failures. And then they created a 10 point scale and figured out, okay, where in this 10 point scale does the risk increase significantly to cause a problem? They found that if a patient had a score higher than six, they had a poor prognosis and over 70% of those patients failed surgery. And so, but if you look at the table here, and of course you have to keep in mind that, you know, in different parts of the world, people feel comfortable with different types of surgery. And in Europe, um, you know, the latter J is a very uh, common operation, whereas here, the bank heart's a common operation. You figure something you do a lot of, you're going to do better anyway. But if you look at the prognostic factors there and, and think about your typical uh, high school football player who walks into your office, right? <clears throat> so he would get two points for being under 20. He would get two points for being in a competitive sport. He would get one point for being in a contact or forced overhead sport. So before you even said hello to that guy, he's got a score of five. And so, so the average high school football player walks in your office, according to Dr. Boileau, should, 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 would not do well with a bank heart repair. But then if you look at other things, you look at you know, other things you get points for. One is shoulder hyperlaxity. So what is that? That is, that is a, an additional lesion to the bank heart. You've got capsular laxity, so your capsule stretched out. A hill sax lesion, that's a bony deficit. So that's an additional lesion on top of the bank heart lesion that you've got or you've got glenoid bone loss. And so you, what you have is patients who have multiple lesions and they're being treated with a bank heart repair and they're failing. And so it's not surprising. So his conclusion was on this basis, we believe that arthroscopic bank heart repair is contraindicated in those patients, in these patients to whom we now suggest a bristol ladder j procedure instead. And so, so their answer was a bristol ladder j with which they were getting very good success. So my question in this lecture is, are there only two options? If the arthroscopic bank is not a good procedure in an isolated fashion, are you automatically required to do a ladder J or is there some other procedure that you can do? Well, certainly, you know, here we, you know, when I was training, it was all open surgery and we did open bank car repair, open capsular shift with good success rate. And, you know, and certainly there are a multitude of arthroscopic procedures, including capsular imbrication, the remplissage procedure, more extensive label repairs and even arthroscopic bone grafting, which is um, becoming popular nowadays and um, probably be mainstream within the next five years. And so <clears throat> that's what this talks are really all about. So who is, who is the ideal patient for a bank heart repair? Well, it would be someone who has an isolated 90 degrees anteroinferior labral tear, who has minimal laxity in the remaining capsule, minimal bone loss, an older patient, you know, and it's all relative, what you consider, you know, being older, young, and, and here it's like in your mid to late 20s is older <clears throat> female patients and then low demand patients. That's the kind of patient you could do an isolated bank heart lesion on and say, this patient has a very high success rate, unlike the, <clears throat> the other risk <clears throat> factors that Dr. Boileau talked about. So why does an isolated bank heart fail? Well, it fails because of other lesions very often. So it's a bone loss either on the, uh, the glenoid or the humeral head or some coexisting capsular laxity. And here you see a patient who's a drive-through sign and pulling on the humeral head and you see how you just gap it away from the, um, from the uh, labrum and the glenoid there or unappreciated more extensive labral pathology, which you'll see is much more common than has been appreciated. And here you can see 180 degree inferior labral tear. So it's both superior and anterior at the same time. 
And so these lesions, if you're treating them with a <clears throat> simple bank car repair, often they'll fail just because you haven't adequately treated all the pathology in that patient. So we know from research in the lab that catheter stretching occurs at the time of a bank heart lesion. So if you uh, in the lab create a bank heart lesion it was by a Volston, you're gonna have a certain degree of catheter stretching that occurs before the labrum tears off. And my professor, Dr. Bibiani was the one that, that showed that. And we also know that the patients who are, are lax to start with have increased risk of instability. So it's a classic, you know, party trick to start with. And then next thing you know, they have a, a, uh, a, an event and suddenly they're tipped over the edge and they go from being lax to being unstable where they're, they're symptomatic. And so we know from multiple series of patients who have a pre-existing laxity in their shoulder are more likely to become unstable than people who aren't. And so we also know there's a huge variability in labral tears. And this is a paper we just published um, last November, actually, <clears throat> and uh, we looked at 280 uh, labral repair surgeries over a seven-year period of time. And we found that if you looked at just isolated bank heart lesions, there was only 48 isolated bank heart lesions, which represented 17% of all the labral repairs we did in that seven-year period. And the anterior inferior labrum, let's see, anterior inferior labrum was involved in a total of 115 labral tears. So that means that out of any uh, labral tears that involve the anterior inferior labrum, less than half of them were isolated to the anterior inferior labrum and, and the, rest, the rest of them extended either superiorly or uh, inferiorly and posteriorly. And so if you look at the isolated bank heart lesion, we had you know 17% of our cases were that only 48, but the ones that extended up or backwards were 115 cases. And so out of all the patients who had a bank heart lesion, only 42% uh, were isolated. So in most cases, when you're looking, you got to keep looking once you see the bank heart lesion, because usually that tear extends somewhere else. And if you don't address that completely, you're going to be in trouble. And so here's just a variety of the labral tears that we saw in that study. You can see that you have every type of pattern you could imagine. So the failure rate of arthroscopic bank heart lesions in, in uh, series are between 10 and 35%. And the risk factors for uh, failure in these are bone loss of the, of the humeral header glenoid, younger age groups, 20 to 25, males more than females have a higher risk of, of failure, and then the number of preoperative instability episodes. There's a very high correlation between that and, and your, your chance of failure with a uh, bank heart repair. And then your collision or your contact athletes are going to have a higher risk of failure than those that don't. If you look at the older literature and we talk about what are the limits of glenoid bone loss where you could really do a bank heart repair, the old literature said, oh, 20 to 25% and you could still you know, do, the, do the bank heart repair and have reasonable results. But if you look more critically at the newer literature, that number has shrunk. And so really right now it's more like 13 and a half to 17% uh, glenoid bone loss before you start seeing a significant failure rate in your bank heart repairs. And so, Deckard in a, uh, in a uh, series looked at um, compared group with no bone loss compared to a group that had an average of 15% glenoid bone loss. And the recurrence rate with no bone loss was 6.3% and with glenoid bone loss, 22%. So four times higher uh, from that bone loss. And so when you start to look at that, you think to yourself, okay, that's not the patient I should be recommending an isolated bank heart lesion for. And it shows the importance of really measuring that glenoid bone loss preoperatively when you're doing your planning. So who's the ideal patient for a ladder shade? Well, a patient with, a, uh, with an off-track lesion who's got uh, bone loss on his glenoid uh, between uh, 15 and 40 percent. You know, once you get beyond that point, you're going to another type of graph. But the problem with the, the uh, ladder shade is it has a significant recurrence rate and complication rate. So you know, if you look at a uh, at, uh, uh, series with zero to 8% instability, fairly high patient satisfaction, 90%, fairly high ASCS rate and very high constant rate. And certainly in Europe where this is a popular operation, they're very successful, rapidly return athletes to, to, to play. And you hear about these soccer goalies that go back quickly from this operation and do very well. The problem is in the United States, we really haven't had the same sort of success rate and probably it's related to the learning curve, you know, because it's not a simple operation to perform. I think there's some nuances to it. And so the complications are all these you see here. And I can tell you that the worst um, complication I've had in my life was an axillary nerve injury with a ladder shake, you know. So I still perform that operation probably every other month. Um, 
but and it's a good operation when it's indicated but you know it, it takes a while to learn how to do it and, and it does make you a little nervous while you're doing it so a complication rate is seven times higher than than in, in the remplissage procedure and so that's one of the operations you're thinking about uh, doing in its place and there are technical challenges with learning curve uh, and one of the concerns I have is we have a patient that has multi-directional instability, has a bank heart lesion, a bony bank heart, and has deficiency. I'm concerned about doing sort of a unilateral reconstruction on that patient for a multi-directional problem. And so, you know, I, I was trained by Nier and Biliani, and it was all about balance, you know, getting a balanced reconstruction in those patients. And um, so I get real concerned about saying, okay, I'm going to address the glenoid bone loss, but I'm not going to do anything else about all the other factors involved in those cases. So again, I think in a latter day, you have to be just like in others, you have to be conscious of what you're treating and make sure that you're addressing all the pathology appropriately. And it is a good operation in the right circumstances. And so, so the principles of management, really, when you're dealing with instability, is you've got to address all the pathology. And in your own mind, you've got to figure out how much is each of these uh, pathologic entities contributing to overall, overall instability in the patient. You want to have a, a balanced repair so you're not shoving the arm out you know, too tight in the front, too loose in the back. And then you want to consider the patient's activity level. What do they need to do with that arm? What can you afford to do surgically to that patient that's not going to restrict them too much? And certainly, if you can do this in a minimally invasive fashion, uh, you're better off. But again, there's no sin to opening a shoulder either. So what are the different additions that you can do for a, a bank heart repair? Well, you certainly do a capsular imbrication. Say a patient's got a laxity, you can do an imbrication at the same time. Uh, you can do a more extensive labral repair if you see a more extensive labral damage. There's been good results reported with that. A remplissage procedure, sewing the rotator cuff into that hill stack defect. And then there's advanced bone grafting techniques that can, can be done as well. So, so what are the roles of these different things? So with patient selection, you know, when you have on-track and off-track lesions of the glenoid and, and the uh, humeral head uh, that play into your, your decision-making, you know, can I adequately address this particular problem of a soft tissue operation? And so we'll talk about that in a little bit. So how does the patient's age enter into the, the equation? Um, how about the number of dislocations, the activity level, and the arm dominance? All these things will play into your decision-making as to whether you can do this or not. Now, calculation of the bony defect, which is one of your first steps in, in your kind of your piece of information you're trying to, to utilize to make a decision, is not completely straightforward. I mean, you look arthroscopically and people talk about, okay, you see the bare area in the center of the glenoid, and you can measure anterior and posterior that, get an idea of how much glenoid bone loss there, are, there is. But very often it looks like this, and I'm like, okay, where's the center? I don't see, you know, I can't really tell how much it is. So arthroscopically, it can be difficult. Um, and certainly you see a big chunk of bone like that, you don't really have an idea either. And on plain radiographs, you see this small little chip here, you think it doesn't look too bad, little chip there. And then, you know, a CT scan can be more helpful, but even there, it, it can be somewhat difficult to figure out exactly what the, what the bone loss is. And I think the best method is using the, you know, the perfect circle. And so we use, we use CT scan a lot. Yeah, you typically get 3D CT scans as well, because it helps me uh, see the size of these defects, and then, you know, do, doing the circle to try and figure out what percentage of your uh, glenoid is involved with this and whether this is something that can be treated with a soft tissue operation or you can repair that fragment of bone or uh, do a ladder J procedure for that patient. And so uh, I think it takes a little bit of practice to kind of get comfortable with these uh, measurements and figure out what you want to do. In, in terms of it, but this is basically the equation you use to figure out how much of the glenoid is missing. So, um, so we talk about a bank heart plus operation. So you do a bank heart repair, then you do something in addition to that, and that could be imbricating a patulous capsule. It can be uh, fixing more of the labrum than just that isolated area in the uh, anteroinferior glenoid, and it can also be um, doing something to address the hill sax lesion. Uh, typically with a remplissage type procedure or not. So what are the limits of those uh, options if you're trying to do this arthroscopically? If we look at uh, extended labral tears, um, there are multiple studies indicating that the success rate of the labral repair, even if it's a larger labral tear, like 180 degrees, 360 degrees, is really equal to the repairing of the bank card. So, so certainly my philosophy has always been, uh, you know, uh, fix what's torn. 
And so you get in there, you see a labral tear, fix the entire extent of that labral tear. And I think that's your best chance of having a good success with, with that particular patient. And, and you'll see the 360s occasionally. Uh, so here's a case. So this is an 18 year old football lineman, first time dislocation, which was good. And his uncle works at our surgery center. So um, that takes me into my office. So uh, he had a bank heart lesion, he had a patchless capsule, he had a small hill sac. Um, a, a lesion, and so this is, you see the hilt sacs right there, um, and then you have patchless capsule, and this is sort of a, a you know, a, a subject of call right here, You're looking at the sagittal view on the uh, CT scan, but often you see this cast capsule, it looks like it's all kind of stretched out and patchless, and you think, okay, it's not a hard call, but I get a soft call that this patient may have some pre-existing laxity, and here you see this hilt sacs lesion, so this is what it looks like arthroscopically. So he had a, uh, a bank heart lesion, a kind of alpha lesion with the capsule healed on the anterior glenoid neck. And then this is poster inferior. That's like the seven o'clock position. You can see that the labrum is off. Uh, superior labrum looks fine. And there's inferior labrum. You see that pedunculated uh, piece of labrum that's torn off there right about the five o'clock position. So basically, has a 180 degree uh, labral tear. And, and there you see the posterior part of the tear. And this was a hill sack theory. You know, you didn't see any bone. I mean, so it was not impressive there. And so what, what did we do? We did a posterior labral uh, repair. We did a bank heart repair. And there you see kind of from the back, you see 180 degree repair uh, back uh, bottom and front. Uh, and here he is, you know, six months later when I cleared him to go back to football. And so good range of motion. You worry about, am I gonna over tighten this guy? I think if you address the pathology, um, the patients will get their um, get their flexibility back, get their, their youth back. Now, here's another kid. This was the one of the five star high school quarterback. He played for um, uh, Pace Academy for a bit. Now he's back out in West Georgia, but he's being recruited by everybody. Traumatic dislocation of his throwing arm went through a, a long course of rehabilitation, did poorly. You see, he's got that indentation of his humeral head there again. Uh, patchless capsule, and this is what we found at the time of surgery. So he's got a bank heart lesion, superior labrum, sort of meniscal, but okay. Again, tear there, tear in the back as well. So very similar to the last case that we did. And he has this very medial uh, hill sacs lesion. You really can't do anything with that. You know, I mean, you can't transfer anything. It's just too far over to lose motion. And so then he had a partial thickness rotator cuff tear at the age of 17 from all this. And so we did the same sort of thing again, 180 degree inferior labral tear. And then we also imbricated his capsule because he's a naturally loose jointed kind of kid. And so we, we snugged him up. And so, you know, the question is, can he still throw? And, and this is from last year, this was one year out from surgery, you know, so that's like 40 yards in the air on the money. And so the kid's good and he can throw. And so we did not, the point of that is that he, we did not get rid of his abduction external rotation with that procedure. And so you're often scared of, I'm going to overdo it. This guy's not going to do well. All right, so what about catheter imbrication? You know, so, so as we said before, laxity is a risk factor for instability. Uh, and even uh, Dr. Boileau has talked about, you know, traction sutures to kind of imbricate the capsule and kind of pull it up as you're doing your bank heart repair. So you achieve, you know, a capsular shift and a, and a bank heart repair at the same time. And it is possible to significantly decrease the volume of the capsule arthroscopically, not just open. And so this is a typical kind of imbrication kind of maneuver. And here again, you see that sagittal cut where you look at that capsule and you think, boy, I would really like to kind of pull that whole thing up and snug it up um, to get this. And there's nobody's published on this, um, this thing. So this is all just sort of theoretical. But here's another patient, 32-year-old office worker. She had a Baton score of eight. Had a traumatic dislocation, no significant Hill Sachs lesion, patchless capsule, and a bank heart lesion. You see the bank heart there in the front, and generally had a very patchless capsule, no real bone lesion. There again, you see your capsule on the on the sagittal, and then a small Hill Sachs lesion there. So we did the same sort of thing. We, you know, superior labrum is okay. It's got the bank heart lesion in the front. Posterior labrum is okay. And so, uh, but there you see her uh, drive-through sign. And I do all these um, procedures in the uh, in the beach chair position, I think probably it, it is maybe easier to do it lateral to cubitus, but it's perfectly easy to do it um, in the beach chair as well. But here's a drive-through sign that the lady's got. That was a hill sax lesion. You can barely see the indentation there. And so what we did was a, we did a, uh, a bank heart repair, 
and we did a capsular imbrication so that um, mm -hmm. go back. Uh, so I don't know if I can go back, but anyway, so um, I did the bank car repair, did the drive-through sign again. It was still very patchless. I went to the back, I imbricated the posterior capsule till till I got what I felt was a reasonable. Um, uh, tightening of the shoulder, and here's her motion at six months. Again, these are the type of patients that get their motion back quickly because you know they they tend to be lax to start with. She's got a little bit of loss of internal rotation, but otherwise has uh, has straight motion. And so the lesson there is you want to balance reconstruction. So you do a nice bank heart repair in the front. If there's still patchless in the back, you pull up that posterior inferior <clears throat> ligament and uh, and balance them out. So what role does the uh, remplissage have in this? Well, the remplissage renders the hill sac defect extra articular, and you get it by sewing the, uh, the posterior capsule and the infraspinatus tendon into the defect. So some people love this and some people hate it. They think that, oh, this is going to limit external rotation, it's going to weaken the infraspinatus. And generally, I, I, I think it has a place and I've, I've used it. So, and in some ways, it's an alternative to a bony procedure. So if you look at patients with subcritical bone loss, and so those are the patients really, you know, less than 13% bone loss. Bank heart alone versus a bank heart remplissage recurrence rate is five times higher for isolated bank heart compared to bank heart plus remplissage. And the bank heart remplissage is equal to the latter J in patients with glenoid bone loss less than 25% in terms of recurrences, row scores, and range of motion. And these are all these different series and meta-analyses on this. And the complications are seven times higher with the latter J. So if you have a reasonable amount of bone loss of your glenoid, uh, the remplissage has a role, okay, as opposed to jumping immediately to a, a um, to a latter J. <clears throat> so so you address bone uh, deficiency, so critical versus subcritical, and really it's that 10 to 25 range of glenoid bone loss is where it's sort of a gray zone. And then uh, so you have to ask yourself how, how, how big is that hill sac lesion. But if you look at this uh, study by Pandy, the bank heart, bank heart, the success of bank heart in an on-track lesion, they had about 8.5% uh, recurrence rate. If it was an off-track lesion, then it was a 30% uh, recurrence rate. But if they did the remplissage and the bank heart on off-track lesion, they only had a 3.4% recurrence rate. So it was effective, even in off-track lesions of, uh, of stabilizing those shoulders. So. Um, you know, as arscopic bank heart alone is going to have a high failure rate. So, what are the limits of remplissage? So, so look at these these um, these different series. So, Govea in 2021, large series, over a thousand uh, patients had bone blocks versus 253 with remplissage, much higher complication rate with the bone blocks uh, compared to the uh, remplissage procedures. Um, and then, um, if you look at the bone block, <clears throat> the bone block was better. Uh, uh, if the glenoid bone loss was greater than 10%. That's what he found. So um, if you are if you have less than 10% bone loss, you could do a remplissage and you have much less um, uh, complication rate and equal result. He was in another study. Here again, a good number of patients. They, they had bank art repair. Uh, bank art failed in uh, eight of 17. And then the bank art remplissage failed in only two of 15 cases. They were comparing those two sets of patients. But if you look at the two failures, when their bank are remplissage, one had glenoid bone loss of 16%, the other 18%. And Yang, in a similar study, found a higher failure rate in patients who had more than 15% glenoid bone loss. So basically, those are the numbers. Somewhere around 15% bone loss of the glenoid. You have that, and really, you're, you're getting to the limits of what a remplissage can do for you, and you have to start thinking about some kind of bony procedure. So what about range of motion with this? Because you are sewing that greater tuberosity and you're decreasing the entire arc of the humeral head. What does that um, do to your motion? Well, there's conflicting results in this in the literature. It, says, it seemed to be relatively small, about five degrees of motion. But a lot of different studies showed very similar results between remplissage, ladder J, and bank art uh, repair on their own. So there's kind of mixed results in that. Uh, there does appear to be decreased range of motion in a couple of city, uh, uh, studies. Uh, basically in rotation, um, but not significant. But if we look at return to sport, though, with the remplissage, about 90% of patients can return to like any sport. But if you look at baseball, only 15% of players can get back if you do a remplissage on that throwing arm. So it's really contraindicated in the dominant arm of a thrower or racket sport play, you know, player. 
So really, you know, it, it's got its limitations. You have a patient who's got a big hill sac lesion and they're a thrower, you really can't address it with a, with a rental size. You really have to be thinking uh, of more of an order of soft tissue. So there's a patient, 20 year old manual labor, recurrent instability, status quo is bank art um, repair. So you can see the little uh, dots from his previous uh, suture anchors. And so he had a significant um, hill sacs defect there. He had no significant bony defect, you know, a little bit there. You can see where the anchors from the previous surgery are. And um, so at surgery, we see a recurrent bank heart lesion there. The pier labrum's okay, posterior labrum's okay. And they see the large uh, hill sac lesion on his humeral head. So we did the remplissage, putting the anchor in the back and then passing the suture through the infraspinatus and the capsule, doing the bank heart repair in the front and then going back and tying this. And then here you can see what the kid looks like. And he's about a year out now with no recurrence and uh, no significant limitation in range of motion. And then finally, let me just finish by saying that open procedures are not a sin. You know, unfortunately, you guys training nowadays and gals aren't um, getting enough open surgery in terms of instability repair. You see everything arthroscopic. But an open bank heart repair and capsular shift are still very viable operations. And uh, open bone grafting procedures are sometimes indicated. Here's a capsular shift. And then, you know, there's all kinds of uh, 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 bone grafting procedures for significant glenoid and bone loss. And in seizure patients, sometimes you got to pull out all the stops, you know, and, and bone graft the uh, hill sac lesion and the glenoid both. So remember that that's part of your armamentarium. And again, you know, you're trying to stabilize that shoulder. You want to address the pathology you have there, and you have to do it however you need to do it, either open or close. So in conclusion, there's a spectrum of pathology that results in glenohumeral instability. Surgical management should address all the contributing anatomic factors. Arthroscopic bank heart and ladder shade have their place, but there are other options. The limits to an isolated bank heart repair appear to be glenoid bone loss is somewhere between 10 and 15%. Label tears can often be underestimated. You want to repair entire torn labrum, so identify the entire extent of the tear before you start fixing. Balance reconstructions will have better results. Remplissage procedures are very effective in the range of 10 to 15% glenoid bone loss with equal recurrence rates function and range of motion of ladder J with seven times less complication. So consider your patient's functional demands. What's he gonna have to be doing with that arm once you're done? Consider your own technical skill. Thank you. You guys have any questions? Why beach chair versus lateral and do you use a uh, Tremano or other arm holder? Um, so uh, why beach chair? Because I was trained in beach chair. You know, I trained in an open and basically East Coast, you know, most everybody trained beach chair. And so, um, you know, when I was a resident, it was all open. Everything was open. And it wasn't until I went back to my fellowship where I started doing arthroscopic surgery and we were just used to the beach chair position. We used to look at it. The only time I would, I would say that um, I'm disadvantaged by a beach chair position is if I got a pretty degree there. But then the arm sublimates, you know, and so then you're trying to get the arm up. Whereas if you are doing that lateral decubitus, you get that nice distraction and you kind of work all the way around to bring it up. There's trouble. But even then, if you, you know, I use an arm holder and I have my PAs, the other thing is you'll put a towel in there and tell them to pull out, give them a little distraction. And often that's going to raise the needle very easily as well. Uh, the other thing we, you know, I've argued with people about is six o'clock anchors, six o'clock anchors. You can throw out a lasset in all the time because I don't use it. Medical College of Georgia, and um, and so to me, you know, the axillary nerve is right there, and you know, why you want to be lifting that? So I, I'm at seven and five, you know, and as long as you've got traction sutures and you're pulling up, you know, this six o'clock tightens up. So there's little nuances like that that you know, you know, I train a lot of ways to skin the cat. Um, you know, when I first started, I didn't. I say even like 16 years ago, I mean, most people did not feel comfortable with carrying a book. You know, you didn't know how to get back there. You say, I want to balance it. Or, you know, you didn't know how to do it, you know? And I will tell you that the single most important is to turn your body. You know, so if you're on a beach chair and the patient's this way, and I'm looking at the, the left shoulder and working like this, I want to do that posterior labrum. I turn around like this, and then just go this way and work like this. That is the appropriate perception. Otherwise, 
It's like trying to trim your eyebrows in the mirror. You know, you're not going to do it. Very well. <laughs> But you, you turn your body around, opposed to labor, and you fix it like that. And so, um, so you know, I, I think you, you know, it's, it's dealer's choice. So get used to what you're, you know, one way or the other. And I don't see any other way. Each one's got its advantages and disadvantages. Hey, Javier. Yes. Hey, it's Spiro Karas. How are you? Thank you. Good talk. Great talk. Um. <clears throat> Let me ask you a question about remplissage. How are you guys coding that now? Well, you know, I have to say that it was, a, you know, we, we asked some people at ASCS to, um, to start coming up with a guidance on how to code this. And uh, I had been coding and we were rotating cup repair because that's what we like. We like that. You know, that's what we need to repair the rotated cup. But ASCS is now recommending that you just code it as a, uh, Sorry about yeah you, you, you know it seems like it'd be a good code 29827 would be a good code for that yeah it technically it's exactly the same thing you do when you do a rotator cuff repair you know? it's a it's an in situ infraspinatus repair into the defect right but and so I think you could do that. I mean, I, you know, I used to do that and I just switched because ASCS recommended it, but not because I ever got. Um, but, but as the president of the ASCS, you should have some pull now into our recommendations. <laughs> Their mind. Like, who, who came up with this? Yeah, I think you know, <laughs> it, it's, it's the insurance game, you know, so I think you can do either way. I mean, when I do an anterior and posterior repair, I used to code those separately but now i just did the 2-2 modifier on that as well so it's just i mean what can you do i think if you send a letter you know if you code it that way and you send a letter saying uh you know this this code better represents a work performed in this procedure i think you could do that yeah i just you know it's just it's it's kind of a hot topic right now i just had my first denial as a 29827 had a had a shoulder surgeon out in california who was a third party reviewer and he said what you said that the academy is now recommending a 22 modifier on the remplissage rather than the 29827 so it 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 it, it appears to me that our own colleagues are kind of I, I i i don't know lost the plot on that i mean it's clearly the most relevant code for what's a completely separate procedure but we're we're getting some pushback now. Yeah, I know. It was like the severe capsule reconstruction. You code that as a two two modifier as well, and that's a lot more work. A lot more. Yep. Yeah, question. Yeah, I had a question about you know you, you talked about dealing with the patchless capsule. My first question is is what about the Ehlers Danlos or collagenopathy patient? Are there other strategies you have to employ? And the second question is does age play a role in, in suture choice? Meaning do you use something permanent or do you do use something that's potentially absorbable? How do you, how do you technically do that in a younger patient? So I think, uh, you know, first question with the collagen vascular, you know, a, a collagen disease. Um, I think in a patient like that, like elders down loss, for instance, you know, um, it would be nice to be able to augment that somehow, but I'm not, I haven't figured out how to do that close, you know, but I, I think that in, in a patient like that who you think has a significant chance of having a recurrence, like they're gonna stretch everything out again, then the most minimally invasive technique is gonna be your best answer because uh, you know the subscap can't take a joke. You know, you take the subscap down, do a big open capsule shift, saying, oh, well, the tissue is gonna be better, the quality of the scar tissue is gonna be better, and it still stretches out. You take that subscap down a second time and it just never functions again. You know, so it's not a good create a bigger problem. So I think you just need to do those arthroscopically and, you know, tighten them up and do a very, very slow rehab. Um, I think in terms of, of uh, uh, technique and suture choice, that sort of thing, I don't know about uh, the resorbable versus, um, versus permanent sutures, but, you know, when we first started doing these uh, imbrication procedures, we were doing it just soft tissue, no anchors, and using absorbable sutures, you know. PDS type of thing, thinking that it would just have to you know, be in there long enough to create the scar tissue and then it'd be fine. But the results are much worse with that. So results with the imbrication procedures 
are much better if you use an anchor, you know, 37 yeah. anchor into the bone. And I'm not sure if that's because it heals better or just your fixation of that tissue is better and you get better scarring. But I, I would say typically I would recommend using anchor for, for mm -hmm. your first procedures. And then most of the time you're going to be using a, uh, an arm procedure for that. Can you speak a little bit as to, you talked a lot about achieving a balanced uh, repair. Can you speak a little bit as to your algorithm for assessing and addressing the balance? Yeah, so there is some um, judgment to that and some feel. And I, I think, you know, so first of all, it, it, it's a, uh, it starts in the office. Like, okay, what are you having trouble with as a patient? You know, so my three kind of questions are, can you throw a ball? You know, that's anterior instability. Can you carry a heavy suitcase? That's you know, inferior instability. Can you push open a heavy door? Can you do a bench press exercise or a, or a plank? You know, so you kind of get an idea what kind of problems that those particular patients are having. And then <clears throat> the second thing is, um, you know, certainly you look at their, their radiographic studies and get an idea of where the pathology is. And, and those are good, but not great. And, uh, you know, like that, one of the aspects of the study, I didn't mention the 280 cases is that the MRI under call the lesion and over in about half the cases, you know, so the MRI is, is can be helpful, but it's not great. You know? So oh. you always have to be looking for other injuries at the, at the time of surgery. And then I think one of the most critical things to keep in mind, and I think, you know, this is very, very important for the residents, fellows, especially, is you have a unique opportunity in the operating room to do a very careful examination of anesthesia. And you get so, you know, hyped about getting the patient on, get the case going, get them prepped, scraped, start. The moment <clears throat> you break the vacuum of the joint, you can no longer do a knee work. You know, so before you put that needle in for the first time, you have to sit there and do, be very careful. And, and Neary used to always say, you got to make sure you locate the shoulder first so it's in the joint and you know which direction it's going in, front, back, bottom, that kind of stuff. And it's and it's subtle, you know. So you should take a you could should take an opportunity to do an EUA on every single patient you do a shoulder on, even if it's a rotator cuff or whatever. So you get a feel for it. And you know, I'm amazed when you know when we're in the OR and you know the the residents come in and try and do an EUA and it, it, it we sort of struggle and it's just very light motions in different directions, kind of get a feel for it, which way it wants to go. And so you put all those things together. What are the patients complaining about? What are their studies like? What's their EUA like? And then you look in there and then you get an idea, you know, you know, what's the drive through sign like? You know, is it very patchwork? Is it, where, what's the labrum look like? What does the rotator interval look like? Often the interval is really wide. And those are the signs of significant back tension. And so, <clears throat> so you know, be thinking there's a combination of lesions in almost every single case you're going to go into. So you see the bank cart lesion or whatever, but you want to look for whatever else is there and what made that patient prone to developing that instability in the first place. And so if you're going to repair the labrum, like if you're going to do a 360 degree uh, repair of the labrum, who can I pick on? Who has somebody to pick on? Uh -huh. Are you in you? Mm -hmm. you <laughs> okay. All right. So this is not a hard question. So you got a 360 degree labral repair. What order do you do it in? Which one do you fix first? Which one do you fix? Uh, work my way around from posterior inferior than anterior. Yeah, perfect. And so, because that's the posterior is the hardest. So, because the thing is, every step you do closes the joint down some more. And so, so the easiest is superior because you, no matter how much you close it down, you still access it. And so, you do the posterior first, then the anterior, and then, and then superior. And so, depends on what where the lesion is. So say the patient's got a posterior labral tear, right? And so you go in there and so you fix that. And then you kind of get a feel for like, my God, this arm still pulls way away. Well, that's when I would go and I do an anterior implication. You know, if it's a, if it's a bank heart lesion, then you're kind of like stuck because like, because you want to fix the back first before you do your bank heart repair. And so uh, you got to sort of figure out, does this patient look really loose? And so one of the things I do is when I've got my scope in the shoulder from behind, I start backing up, you know, so I'm looking at the posterior labrum and I say, how much can I back up before I fall out of the joint? And because, you know, suddenly you're backing up, backing up, and you're seeing everything beautifully. It's not because you're a great arthroscopist. You might be, but it's because of the, the capsule's patchless. So you think, okay, this guy's got a really patchless capsule. And then the other thing is good to do is look from the front, you know, so, so I'll put a switching stick in the back, <clears throat> move my camera to the front, and then you get a good look and you go, wow, that is like, you know, cavern back there, you know? And so, um, 
So those sort of things give you a tip like, yeah, I'm gonna to need to be imbricated. But you know, you think about, you know, the other thing we talk about with, uh, with instability surgery, it is not, it is not an anterior, it's not a, a side to side surgery, it's a bottom up surgery. You know, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get that, that uh, capsule and that inferior glenohumeral ligament, you know, the, 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 the lift it up, you know? And so you're thinking if you're lifting up the front with your bank card repair, you really want to lift up the back that the posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament to really get that, get that, you know, hammock up evenly like that, you know? And so, um, so, you know, so I think those are sort of the factors you use when you're trying to try to decide how much to do in each of those locations. The other thing to keep in mind is patient age. You know, we talked about that. And for, it depends on what your problem is, you know, in, in the body, you know, what's young, what's old in terms of the shoulder. And I always tell people that 35 is the middle age of the shoulder. That's where you could behave like a young shoulder or an old shoulder. Or you're not quite sure when a 35 walk, year old walks into your office, kind of what you're dealing with. You know, when you're, you're 20 year olds, you're dealing with instability. And when they're 50 year old, you're dealing with cough, you know, or else arthritis, you know, so, but that in between ages, it's sort of tough. Also, you'll notice that your young patients, uh, you know, if you look at the recurrence rates after, you know, index uh, instability, you know, for VLISIS studies and stuff, uh, your younger patients have a higher relocation rate. Your older patients, you know, if they didn't tear their cough, they actually have a hard, they have a hard time getting the flexibility back because they get so stiff. So when you're doing your instability surgery on somebody that's 40 for some reason, which, you know, it's pretty rare to be doing it, I kind of like under treat because that patient is going to stiffen up and is going to have a hard time getting the flexibility back. If I'm dealing with like an 18-year-old. I don't worry about over tight them a little bit. You just modify your rehab program. They're going to get that flexibility back. So you take that into account when you're deciding as well. Great. I guess I'll, I'll finish up. So just one question on Hill Sachs, um, especially over the last couple of weeks here. So one... Uh, do, are you worried over time about uh, sort of repairing the relatively short upper space and into the defect and then the, what it's going to do over time with potentially risk protecting tears when they get older? And two, um, or muscular thinning tears, and two, um, maybe give them, if you don't mind, maybe give uh, some of the more senior residents some technical pearls on how to do a, a really well done hill sacks, how you evaluate where to put your anchors, all that stuff. Right. <clears throat> so I don't, I don't know the answer to that first question. It'd be interesting to see what happens, you know, because we do create some problems as time goes on. You know, I'm sure the guys that were doing Bristow procedures, you know, in the 50s didn't realize how much arthritis they're going to create either, you know, so that could be a problem. Uh, and the people who don't like the operation are concerned about loss of strength, weakness, tethering of that muscle group. So that, that could possibly be a problem. I think that you're, you're pretty lateral. I mean, you're, you're, you're really, really in the tenderness portion still. So it's possible you could get that later, but so far nobody's reported it that I know of. So, um, you know, in the short term, the answer is it's been okay. In long term, we'll have to wait and see what, what happens. Um, so the the, um, the the hill sacs lesions basically, um, you know, the, the, you, you fix them just like what uh, Spiro was saying. It's like a rotator cuff repair, you know, transcendent rotator cuff repair. And so, um, if you have a if you're going to do a remplissage bank cart repair. Then, then what you want to do, just the steps are, uh, is you uh, prepare your uh, hill sacs, you put your anchors in, you pass your sutures through the tendons, and you don't tie them yet. And then you do your bank art repair, and then you come back and tie your, uh, your sutures. So, excuse me, the tricks I use, I'll, I'll be looking, you can either look from posterior or anterior, either way, depending on sort of the anatomy of that particular hill sac lesion. But often you can be looking from posterior and still see it adequately. And so then I will, I will put a uh, five millimeter cannula across the rotator cuff into the joint to the posterior lateral portal. So my portal is like a centimeter off uh, lateral, maybe slightly posterior to the posterior corner of the acromion. And I put that right in there and, it, and it, that, it, that puts you right directly into the uh, hill sac defect. So to get the, the, the defect, to breed it, I'll either use a small full radius resector, like a 3.5 millimeter, or I just get an elevator and stick it through there and just kind of scrape the stuff off of it, you know, mm -hmm. to get nice cancellous bone in that area. 
if it's a, for the majority of hill sack leaves, I'll use one anchor, but if it's a really big one, uh, it goes you know, all the way down the back, I'll use two. And that's kind of a gestalt thing based on, you know, putting your anchors about a centimeter, of, your sutures about a centimeter apart. And if you think that's not gonna quite cover the lesion, then you may want to use a second. The most important part of your hill sacs lesion is the superior part. That's what's gonna engage. And so that's what's most critical to make sure that that top part of your hill sacs lesion is the one where you get the, the tendon sewn into place. And so, um, so I put the anchor into the bone and I put it, depends on how big the, the defect is, how close I go to the rim. If it's not that big, I'll go right to the, the, to the beginning of the articular margin. But if it's huge, I kind of go halfway because I figure you know, I'm getting rid of part of it, but trying to not limit the, the amount of motion that patient can have because you're, you're, you're eliminating that arc of motion from the patient by making that part of the humeral head anchor and taking it. And so then once I have my anchor in, and uh, so then I'll, I'll usually be looking from the front portal. So I'm looking from the front portal and I've got, um, if I'm just gonna do one anchor, I have the one anchor going into the bone uh, and then I've got my cannula there. And so I'll back the cannula into the subacromial space so that all four suture limbs are, um, coming up through the rotator cuff to a central uh, pole. <clears throat> and then I get my tissue penetrator and I pass it like one centimeter superior to that. And I grab one suture and then I go one centimeter below it and I grab one suture. So then what I've got is I got a combination that looks like this where my central hole still got two stitches and then I got one stitch above and one stitch below like that. And so when I tie them down, it's gonna pull all those things down together. And so, um, so then I, I um, <clears throat> do the bank car repair and then I tie them blindly. So I just watch and I, I tie my, you know, I do non-sliding knots and I tie them blindly. And then I, and then I go up into the subacromial space afterwards and make sure that there's no, I didn't cut any fascial fibers of the deltoid stuck into that and kind of debris that area, just make sure that it's completely free. Right. So that's sort of my pearls. Do you understand why it is superior? Why are we talking about the sphere? And that's a really important note. So right when you're when you're they're dislocating when they're engaging, right? There's abduction or short additions so that's that that superior, that super half thing engages. And that's that's the whole idea of, of this blocking off that that motion or preventing that motion from happening. Yeah, you know, I, I started doing knotless. Uh, do you have an opinion on, on the knotless technique? This was the Peter Murray, or not Peter McDonald, um, you know, Winnipeg group that sort of First, sure, talking about the chart, talking about the knotless and their, you know, that randomized control that are all they did. For which, for the labrum or for the, for the hill sack? Uh, the knotless, uh, they, they published on it, they were, did it in the randomized control trial of hill sacks alone versus, or Vancouver alone versus Vancouver versus hill sacks. They did knotless. First time I'd sort of seen that. So I um, it sort of switched to knotless. I don't know. I mean, it's basically the same thing as wood. Just like they just have, you know, the, the little thing that you can feed into it. Do you have an opinion on that, or would you rather, would you rather not, not? So I think, so I think the only, the only place that I really sort of feel like it's absolutely necessary to use knotless is when you're doing a labral repair posterior superior. You know, that's because there's some literature that suggests that in the abduction actually rotated position, especially like a volleyball player, I think is where the real literature came out of, that there could be some still irritation of the cuff against those anchors, against those knots. And so there I always use knotless anchors. Everywhere else, I really feel like it's dealer's choice, you know. So, so you know, I I taught myself on anchors with knots, and I still do that. But I could switch if I needed to. Uh, I think one of the one of the nice things about Peter's technique is that you're getting this broad uh, swath of tissue to come down. And so, uh, some of the companies will have have techniques where you can do those, and where you got some tapes and they you, you cinch them up and it pulls a whole broad. Uh, band of you know tendon right into that defect so i think it's a very secure way of doing it um so, so i think it has a lot of merit but there's a lot of different ways you can do it and you have to find a way that feels comfortable for you any more questions guys well um so we were going to do case presentations at 7 30 so i figured we can uh, it's kind of i guess it's kind of here or i don't know if you guys have opinions you guys want to do a case or two or do you want to uh, call tonight all right do we do a quickly? Yeah, it's okay. Let's do our always do one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Right, we'll just first. do two quick ones, run through some stuff. Okay. Discussion and then we'll, uh, you don't mind. No, no, it's great. Perfect. Love it.
Awesome. So this is a patient that we uh, took care of this past year. He's a 24-year-old with a seizure disorder uh, and recurrent shoulder instability. He's being filled for his lifetime. He's had over 100 dislocations. Fortunately, he got into neurology. His seizures are now controlled, but he has a very painful and still out working activity. He doesn't have any previous shoulder surgery uh, and is otherwise healthy. Uh, so on the exam, he had kind of positive anterior provocative findings. Uh, but interestingly, negative posterior provocative uh, maneuvers with regard to the shoulder um, associated with impact and even with this. So these are his uh, plain radiographs uh, in which we can see some anterior glenoid loss in the sacs. He has some advanced imaging, which confirms that we have significant glenoid and humeral bone loss. Assuming this patient's seizure disorder is controlled, with this amount of bone loss in this young, healthy <laughs> um, these were kind of the options that we were considering. What would you do with this patient if you were in your office? We go back to the last slide. So, so our thing here is with significant humeral head loss, a humeral head defect. And then, um, which really, uh, uh, and then, you know, a, not a terrible, he's got, he's got some uh, glenoid bone loss as well, but he didn't have like really an inverted pair. He's just, it, but he, he is certainly missing some significant bone. So the thing about the soft tissue options, um, if you did a remplissage on this guy, he would have such a small amount of arc of, of, of humeral head left that he had a very, very limited range of motion. So that's not a good option for him. And then, and then on the glenoid side, you know, he's missing that front rim. And so you're looking at, okay, I need to replace that bone somehow. Is that, can I do that adequately with a, um, with a corpus or like a letter J, or is it so big that I need to do like a uh, distal tibial allograft, you know? So, that one doesn't look that bad to me. Now, some of these cases, you have to be cautious because <clears throat> they come in with a broken coracoid. You know, see, yeah. and you're like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta, you got to find another graph. So, so on that, humeral head flow is kind of just both sides of this, you know. So I would want to get, um, you know, some uh, fill in the, the hill sacs defect, and I'd want to uh, uh, give, you know, uh, bony buttress there to the front of the glenoid. And so young. And uh, so you know one option on an older patient is a uh, a humoral head replacement or humoral resurfacing arthroplasty which achieves that. And you know they do make what are those things called? I can't remember the Tony Miniacci design. The one the fill in the specific device. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the hemi cap. It, it's a hemi cap. But I found that those things, you know, uh, you take out so much bone and you put them in that you might as well just have a hemi, you know. So I, I haven't really liked those very much. And then, um, and so, so in general, I would have been, I would do some type of allograft into this humeral head. And, um, you know, it's hard to get uh, a fresh osteochondral allograft, but you can. I've done that before and then just done headless screws down into it. And more recently, it's just been easier to get a piece of femoral head and stick that in there. And that seems to, to work out pretty well, too, and with, with a couple of headless, say, you know, uh, compression screws. Uh, on the glenoid side, I think I would do a ladder shape on this one just because I think he's got some bone loss, but it's not terrible. And, a, and a, the coracoid, if it's intact, is there not some picture you're not showing me with a broken? No, there's no coracoid. <laughs> 
when you, if you did a live jam this with the Himalaya bone graft, um, if they did the Himalaya bone graft, I would assume you take down the subscap. Um, would you repair back the subscap and then do in the Himalaya J um, through through a split, or um, how, how would you how would you manage that? Yeah. So we, so we um, yeah, so I take the subscap down because then basically when I'm doing my uh, the humeral head, when I'm doing my humeral head, Alagraft, it's like I got the arm in a position like this, like the shoulder. So it, you know, it's a 120 degree directional rotation. So you're really looking at the back up. And then uh, again, touching the rest of the nerves, saw blade, and you get bleeding bone there. And so that also allows me to do a capsule shift at the same time, rotating down the capsule, which I'll do a rotation of that at the same time. Uh, so, and so then before I reattach my uh, subscap, I make a split in there. And then I, you know, take down the torcoid. So I might take down the torcoid at the beginning, but it just makes the closure so much easier. And then, uh, Uh, on the native limb, and so I've been preparing my blade room to get the capsule onto, onto the torcoid piece, even though it kind of puts it into a sinker, but it's still, um, you know, sinkers are on the washers for the, uh, for the sinker, but there's no, no ladder shed. And so for that, and then I just repair my, uh, I take, I don't know what you do for your totals, but I get into a, a, a phenomenon. And so I just do this not on the again. Okay. Um, and then is there a limit in your opinion of what a lot what like what's your bone loss that a large can make up for that you fail to sort of detail? Like what is that threshold? So we think for me, I think the torcoid can get about 10 millimeters on that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and so the you know glenoid is about 35 millimeters across. And so if you're missing about a third of it, you can get it. The corcoid can do it. So yeah, these are the options we kind of considered for those who were saying we want to treat kind of both sides. So we did bipolar allograft. Activity on this one, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, to me, it struck me that it, it, it weren't missing that much bone, so but I think this decision would be fine. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it, without question, it's not uh, like you need to do it just to clear that. Being said, I've already taken out the subscaps, so I kind of felt like it was going to be sitting right there, yeah, right. Yeah. Like, my biggest problem with this activity is. is you don't take down the conjoint. Um, it can be uh, challenging getting that angle. Right. Um, uh, but with the subset down, it's, it's not, not, not as difficult. Right. So this is, as you mentioned, this is the hyper external rotation that you can see. So this is us preparing that big heel sacs. Uh, I mean, sorry, the, yeah, the big heel sacs. Um, the, uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, this is, uh, sorry. I, uh, whenever I approach these young patients, just like I do with the anatomic, like I do a little osteotomy. So yeah, it looks like it, yeah. I don't know, I'm a lesser osteotomy. This is preparing the hillside. Um, and this, as you mentioned, it's abduction or has a tremendous amount of extra rotation. It's, 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 it's really, really hard to get, get over posteriorly. Those uh, the reversal sites are much easier to get to if you're not doing less on that already. And so measuring defect. And then, you know, I've, I've used terminal head allograph. I, I'm, the terminal head does sound interesting. Um, and, and Joe Lampa, I think, mentioned TALIS as an option too that, I've, that, I've, that, that people have brought up to me. But um, but I, I don't know. I've always so how do you get your your allograft uh, through MTF? So I, I usually with the right with the head, you have to have uh, a couple of weeks at most least. Um, but the uh, but if I give them enough notice, they usually they usually can get them by, get them here. Um, so I just tell the patient, so you know, we're gonna wait until we get it. And at this point, they're, especially with the seizure shorters, like I'm not like right. hating that we're we're making them be seizure free for a while. And then this is a sort of three. Compression screws, so these kind of pretty long um, compressions, uh, very compression screws. So this sort of, uh, so I use obviously sort of arthritic system. I like arthritic systems because it has some really long ones. And these are often like fifty. Uh, um, 
día como la Um, Margie, if you don't use this, what other options do you have for Kona? Uh, as far as allograft? Grafting the Kona. Yeah, besides Latter day, what other options do you have? Uh, I mean, he alluded already to the femoral head. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think any, you just need a big bone block. I, think, I don't think sure. it. Yeah. Right, iliac crest, right? Iliac crest, yeah. Iliac crest, yeah. So the truth. So that was like the traditional way people did, and then the tibia sort of uh, replaced that in some respects just because you feel so good afterwards. Instead of having a bone, you have that cartilage. Who knows if that real cartilage actually like stays and, and, and is there? So, I mean, that's the I think yeah. we, we like the suit because it looks really good at the end, yeah. but it's it's hard to say whether uh, or say whether it actually fills in. Uh, but here's the distal tibia. So, you can see you take the uh, medial side of the distal tibia. And, Sort of, you measure out your gut, but usually it's like a fairly, fairly big part of it. But it looks so satisfying because it has cartilage on yeah. it. Now, it's not obviously living cartilage. It's probably, you know, it's probably not as good as it like us truly because it's not autographed, but at the same time, it looks really good to have. Also, it's incredible anatomically. It's a So, uh, it's so satisfying. You can mold it however shape you want. You get this like ideal graph for your with regards to your screws on side, and it's just like makes it makes it really really satisfying. This is just a shovel. Derek, do you use any any biologics? Do you soak that in BMAC? Because we do that pretty routinely in the knee. Uh, um, as a non board surgeon, I don't have a lot of experience with uh, stem cells and here magic, so no, no, I don't. Um, I like the idea, Joe, and I've heard about it, but I, I this is not like something I, I've uh, I, I know a whole lot about. And, and pretty much makes sense. Maybe maybe it um, maybe it gets uh, maybe it helps to seed this seed this allograft with some cells. But um, I have not done that tradition. No. I mean, I have not done that, but maybe I should. So where do you get the VMAC from? You aspirate right from the hip. Iliac crest. Yep. Interesting. That's great. I mean, that's kind of the just a bit This is four weeks. This is uh, yeah, well, he's this is 12 weeks. See, we did his other side. Um, that's why he's in surgical gown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, um, but we did his other side, but um, the uh, so he's at um, that long. Uh, that's great. I mean, these you know, with these kind of cases, the patients are more worried about stability. You know, they can lose a little bit of motion, but they're more functional. Absolutely. And then so this is the other side. You can um, see sort of some of the limitations. They ask very similar to that with you, but see them almost engaging on that one. Oh yeah! Wow. So. Hey, Eric, I just had a, a quick comment. You kind of asked a really important unanswered research question, and that's what's the upper threshold of ladder J and what's ladder J able to do? And um, we did a biomechanics study that's currently kind of, you know, being written up in fellowship. And what we saw is that if you didn't restore kind of 100% of the glenoid width with whatever you're going to use, whether that's ladder J or, or distal tibia, um, there was an increased kind of rate of, of dislocation, right? So I think the goal, and you can template these preoperatively, you can look at the coracoid width and kind of what you're going to restore. But I think the goal should be to restore 100% of the glenoid width. I, I've never really felt comfortable like, like laying the coracoid on its side, you know, which you, some people have, uh, have uh, recommended because you get a little bit more. To me, this seems very unstable in that position, you know. So I, I, I put my coracoid in that position, and if, and if it, if it not enough bone, then I think going with a uh, distal tibia is a much better solution. Did you guys come up with a number? Well, it, it varies on the patient, right? So if they have a wide glenoid, it depends on their percentage bone loss and what you can restore, right? So it's 100% specific to that patient and their glenoid dimensions and their coracoid dimensions contribute to that, right? 
So you can't give, you know, a millimeter number or percent number. It's whatever you're able to restore with their coracoid. So Joe, you do that with the perfect circle and then you measure how much you need to restore in that perfect circle and then you measure the coracoid and see if they had enough. Interesting. Exactly. And I agree that congruent arc method, I think it's, it's nice, but if they have, uh, if their height, if you call, you know, the standard method is you basically, sorry, hold on a second. Um, the, the standard method I think we all use, you're kind of putting that wider undersurface against the anterior aspect of the glenoid. The congruent arc method, you're using that thinner height and it's more curved, it's harder to sneak screws into. And if that's less than a centimeter, I just think there's a high risk of fracture. And I've, quite frankly, I think if, if a standard ladder J is not gonna work, I agree a distal tibia is just a safer bet than turning it sideways unless they have really wide coracoid. So I've never messed with a congruent arc. I'm not sure what your guys' experience has been with that. I, I worry about the fracture too. Um, I saw two fellowship fracture when they tried to do their congruent arc. Um, and especially, especially in, in, in uh, I think in a very large man maybe, but in females, I, I'm just not sure it's, it's, it's big enough for the screws, the size screws I want to get. So I, I don't like the congruent arc. I've done more of the traditional. Yeah, I've never done it. It doesn't look good to me. It makes me nervous. I, I think it's worthwhile to template your coracoid pre-op because you'd be surprised. Some patients, especially females, can have small coracoids and you cut something that's, you know, 15, 16, 17 millimeters. It sucks. You know, you end up doing a Bristow. <laughs> that, that happens in the cases where with fractures, with fractures, you, have, you just got a small piece. But, you know, um, yeah, it's not ideal. It's not ideal. You, you, you know, if I were to, if I were to say anything about this, I would kind of look at kind of the track record for Ladder J in these tough cases. Um, and it's darn near impeccable, right? If you look at Havelius and what's he got now? 20 year follow up on Ladder J, he's got a 6% failure rate. Obviously, these are all comers, but they were also in patients who, you know, had some of the most severe. Um, instability and osseous lesion. So, I mean, I'm, I, I'm a fan of the distal tibial allograph. I've used it a couple times, but uh, hard to argue with the latter J in terms of managing anterior inferior glenoid bone loss. Um, it's, a, it's a standard bear and a great operation. It's almost always 10 millimeters, right? Um, Javier, I think you'd mentioned that, that, you know, you got to kind of look at the amount of glenoid bone loss, but in my opinion, it's almost always 10 millimeters, you know, kind of it's superior to inferior direction, the direction it's going to be laying down. So unless you've got 30% bone loss, let's say what your typical glenoid is what going to be 32 to 35 millimeters, unless you're approaching 30% bone loss, that ladder J is going to be fairly utilitarian for most of your glenoid bone loss issues. Um, yeah. Can you guys talk about, in your experience, complicate? I haven't done enough of these to, you know, knock on wood, see complications. But one of the downsides that you talked about earlier, Dr. Duralde, was the markedly increased risk of complications. Um, have you guys experienced that in your practices? Yes. Uh, yes, I have. <laughs> I don't know about markedly increased risk, but I've had a couple non-unions mm -hmm. of uh, of ladder J. I've had a couple non-unions over a twenty-year career yeah it's at the cost of decreased repeat dislocation events right relative well yeah well you know i think uh what, what was it higgins and jp looked at it years ago and they had you know you know they had a significantly higher complication rate but th th these were also the most complex instability patients in their practice right joe they've been multiply operated on uh, that failed previous procedures um so you, you, you know, when I look at the ladder J in the setting of when we use it, that operation acquits itself very well. Yeah, I think for the for the residents and fellows, it's important to understand, you know, we talk about things, you know, theoretically, you know, and, but, but if you look in practicality, what, what Dr. Karras is saying is true, is that, you know, in the vast majority of cases where you have bone loss, your ladder J is going to be adequate to, to handle that. And then you know, you can have the rare cases. I mean, literally I've done two distal tibias, you know, so because most of the time the ladder J is enough. And, and I think the other issue here is comfort level, you know? So you go to Europe and they do a ladder J for everything, they're pretty darn good at it, you know? So yeah. 
the learning curve. And so, so they get good results. And whereas and, I, I may do 10 a year, you know, something like that. And it's like, uh, you know, it's hard. Every time you go in there, you're struggling a little bit. And so, yeah. so I think all those factors play into it as well. Hey, hey uh, Javier, you know, uh, Gilles Walsh loved the Ladder J for MDI. He thought it was a great operation for MDI because of the uh, because of the coracoid sling. You, you know, I think in 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 North America we'd kind of shy away from ladder J in the setting of MDI. Um, but you, you, you know, I guess uh, you, you know, uh, not every nail uses the same hammer. But uh, you, you know, my distal tibia allografts have come and failed ladder J, right? I mean, that's that's my bailout for my failed ladder J. Right. Well, you know, I think the, the, the subtleties of that operation are important to understand as well. I went and observed uh, Gilles Walsh operate, uh, you know, back, back in 2000. And uh, he is like an unbelievable surgeon. He's a gifted, I mean, he cuts in between the vessels, you know, with a knife and nothing bleeds. And, and so, you know, he does these operations in no time flat. And I thought, well, this is unbelievable, you know, because he makes it look so easy. And then one of the people visiting that day, uh, along with me, was one of the fellows, and he said, oh, you know, I have a, a failed ladder, Jay, and I was wanted to present it to you, see what you think, and so he presented the case, and Jill said, well, I think your, your bone block's just a little bit too high, you know, and so then I started to realize there's a lot of subtleties to this operation to get the bone back to block exactly the right spot, not too prominent, because you can get arthritis, and I've had cases that have, you know, I've had a case I revised was not my own, but you know, screws were prominent, the patient became arthritic, had to have a humeral head replacement at a relatively young age, nerve injury I told you about already, had graft failures, you know, things like that. So Joe, the answer is yes, there's a million different kind of uh, complications you can have from this operation, but it is a good operation when it's done well. And one of the things compared to distal tibia, at least in my mind, is I mean, it's, it's easier than distal tibia too, because you take down the coracoid, so you're not fighting the conjoint to get your angles um, you do have risk because the nerves are not protected for sure. Right. Hey, I'll, 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 I'll tell you a, a funny anecdote. I got in to do a seizure disorder ladder J one time and the coracoid was fractured. And uh, we found it, we cleaned up the backside and we put it down, no harm, no foul. That patient ended up doing pretty well. So even in the setting of a fractured coracoid, um, I, I, I got to say it was a surprise. We didn't pick it up pre-op uh, uh, insanely enough, but I was able to, I was able to use that with two screws, got lucky, but it happens. Our next shoulder and stability case is a 42 year old a uh, volleyball referee who has a seizure disorder, a longstanding left, worse than right, shoulder instability, innumerable subluxations, dislocations, uh, now relatively well-controlled seizure disorder without having had a seizure in about a year, uh, who just hates her shoulder. SSD of about 10%, uh, four out of 10 pain at rest, and nine uh, with activity. She's had numerous surgeries. She's not exactly sure what, but she's otherwise fine. Uh, this is her exam. She's got a lot of anterior apprehension and shift. Uh, negative posterior flux maneuvers. Uh, plain films, you get the idea that she's had a prior bank cut or some crash there. There's some, maybe a, just a tiny bit of arthritis, questionably, um, and a lot of. Great uh, super on infra and a pretty rough look at the subscap there. A lot of faces uh, in school. Uh, screw tracks with the idea that there's a lot of anterior winnowing defects as well as. A lot going on there. <laughs> so it's you know one of the things you worry about is the weakness of the uh, of the bone there in the, in the glenoid. You know, so especially contact athletes. One thing we didn't talk about 
If you put a glenoid like this on a football player, send or a rugby player, send them back out there, you're going to fracture right through those those, yeah. those holes, you know. And so again, we go back to what you know what we're talking about in 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 the uh, talk. One of the problems this lady has, so uh, she's got some glenoid deficiency. She's got a, a large humeral head defect. She's 42 now, right? Yeah. Um, now she's got a crummy substance yeah. on top of it, you know. So and so then, so you 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 you, uh, you know added that element to everything else. So, so it's a dynamic problem, and not only is it a static problem as well. So I mean, I think there's a lot of actions. Most of them aren't that good. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, like in the old days, what we used to do this was say uh, calcaneo Achilles algebra. You know, so we would screw calcaneus into the front of the glenoid, and then use the Achilles tendon. Uh, Capsule. Wow. You know, that's the that's <laughs> but it was not dynamic at all. Yeah, sure. You know, but it worked, you know, because you got your bone and your ligament right there together. And so you could you could sort of like the large visas that bone block on and then we've had a lot of traditions for that graph. It comes with a little Achilles bone block, uh -huh. calcaneus bone block that you can we always cut it off, but you can you can yeah. Yeah. You're trying to do both things and you know that's that's one way to get around it, but it's not dynamic. You know? so, so the other thing is you've got a big, so you, you can put a big enough bone block in the front where you wouldn't have to address the bull sack necessarily. Um, at 42, with a little bit of arthritis, you could think about a humeral head replacement, yeah. you know, so because you see he's old enough to where that's a reasonable option, and that may sort of kill two birds with one stone because you get rid of the bull sack lesion and you also address that, that uh, arthritis is started. And then, um, and then you got the dynamic issue uh, of the, the, the subcap not functioning well. Probably your best option there is going to be your um, lat transfer, you know, to the front, you know, to try and give you give yourself some uh, some subcap there. But you know, it's a lot of surgery. So for instance, for delta pectoral, you do a humeral head replacement monitor, and then um, and then you want to do something for the glenoid before you close up because it, it is deficient. And so, um, so I guess it, it depends on, you don't really know what a capsule is like when you go into it. Yeah, I mean, until you really lay eyes on it, you get a feel of it. Yeah, the therapeutic thing is not going to be very good. Um, yeah, so, so I think, you know, the, the, the options there would be something like the calcaneo Achilles or some type of grass tissue like that. And then to do a, you know, a, a line transfer to the mushroom. So some variation on that. So what do you do? Yeah, yeah. I'm dying to see. That's okay. Uh, yeah, so the, the route we went with was the combination of the anterior capsule reconstruction and the distal two dollar graph. And then oh yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead. The way you find it is it's just below where the subcap would be, or, or just medial to your bicepal group. So you find your lateral to bicepal group is your, is your pack, medial to the bicepal group is your latissimus. And so you can sometimes take down a little bit back in the heart ratio of latissimus. Uh, I did do it just, I promise you, uh, either I don't do just right now. It was any you, need, you need an intervention. <laughs> There's very few times we actually use NCAs, but this is one of them. As you mentioned, I think the notch had a, uh, a big defect, and instead of dealing with, with the uh, delta sacs, we could just do a big enough DTA that we could uh, we could sort of bypass that. And, and then, in addition to this DTA, we did do an anterior capsule reconstruction. The uh, but this one, instead of your idea, which I actually I actually do like your idea a lot, um, but the uh, this one was with, with the the same graph that we used with SCR. So, um, but we did it on the anterior side. So we, we fixed it in place, just as you can see here, um, using uh, using using the same same fingers that we used for the SCR, but did it on the, on the outside of the of the uh, graph. Um, and then then it was so it's over the top of the testing after we did the testing. Just shuttling shut that graft in um, over the top of the distal tibial graft that's already been placed. Um, measuring it in situ. In this case, obviously, it's open. You don't have to do the arthroscopic measurement. Oh, that's just showing the glenoid and the DTA. And then, um, 
and then then naturally it will be easier to measure these than that. And, um, then your uh, then your your SDR if you don't do it just sitting right there. So you place these medial anchors um, on the medial part of this. That's my latissimus over up to the top of the lesser tuberosity, and then over the top of the latissimus and any remnant subscapular that I can mobilize. I put the uh, I put this ACR graft and then um, fix in place with like a double row, just like you do with the uh, with the SCR. So so basically just copying the SCR technique, but doing it open on or over the lesser tuberosity. So nothing to sort of. Uh, so what position do you have the arm in while you're tightening that graft up? Yeah, I, I do the graft. Rotation because I know it's going to stretch out over time, but um, but I obviously don't want to um, get, leave it too loose at the same time too. So yeah, yeah. So, so I do do it about twenty degrees actual rotation. Mm -hmm. um, cool. And uh, and then that's what it sort of looks like. I think we have some post op stuff. Yeah, yeah. We got a sheet too. I think to make it back into a gown. Yeah, versus post op, you can see she got back pretty pretty well. This is the other side. We're not doing an exploded procedure on the other side. Um, this is her back there. And I think we have longer. Involved, right? Yeah, okay. you're right. Oh, go back. Sorry, I think you have to go back again. Go back again and then come back. Oh, that's great. So uh, the subscap transfer sort of worked. I mean, it, they never totally restored their uh, their belly press. They maybe get a little bit stronger in trial rotation. The uh -huh. belly press sign like doesn't totally go away. I found with these these uh, lat transfers, but um, they do they, they do get pretty good. Um, a pretty good function. See here, that's so probably the probably most important in your stable. And then we have some DD arteries that kind of cool to watch what's actually going on in the in the shoulder. So um, so you can kind of get a sense. Although she's not going up all the way in that DDR, so I'm not exactly sure why she's going up all the way. But you can kind of get a sense on the lateral that she's at, that she is like. Um, uh, the, I think it was helpful having the the, the distal tibia allograft in there. Um, mm -hmm. go to the next one. Let me show you. Yeah, rotation. Um, well, it's not the perfect DDR, but you kind of get a sense that she's kind of going along the uh, I think right she's going, the graph, yeah, yeah, going along the graph and stuff like that. So I think that's like the kind of cool thing about the yeah. So you, you what you did you created a deeper a bigger, you know, socket. A bigger socket, exactly. which yeah. helped compensate for that. that exactly. 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 And I think the bigger socket and then with the ACR, I think it just um, kind of creates like a new quote. It's a little bit deeper, but how these like motion actually. Yeah. Cool. yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, it's really nice. I mean, she loved it. You said her SSB was like 90%, 10%. Yeah, she's back. She's actually uh, going to uh, give me an Olympics, be involved in the Olympics. Yeah, she's, <laughs> she's, uh, she's, uh, I mean, she's not playing ball herself. So it's not how yeah. high the competitive athlete, yeah. but she herself is pretty active. That's for great. Program. I mean, you can certainly look at it. I think the only thing that I would say is, especially if you're a uh, reconstructive surgeon, you're always planning your next yeah. operation after this, you know? So the worry is if she becomes arthritic, you know, how do you start that joint? Yeah, yeah. No, so, I mean, that's that, and that would be the tough. I mean, obviously, your injured collapse wouldn't be good. Your lat collapse is still, it's, it's not quite the same, you know, it's not quite the same angle as the things. You probably could still approach it without having to do a lot to the lat. Um, but you're right. I mean, that's the question is like, if she becomes arthritic, like, can you just do like a hemorrhoid or something like that? Or, or, I mean, hopefully it's late enough that you can do a reverse because I think. You know, as, as some as like Sanchez and, and, and actually Walsh and those guys, like when you have a history of some sort of you know bony instability procedure, your, your outcomes with anatomics are not the best. All right. Um, I don't know. It's a little tough one. We had one more to show you, but uh, Otto's uh, my our other calls on here. Plus, it's getting a bit late, so I figured maybe we'll call call. Oh, that's good. That's good. Those are good cases. Um, and the say cool. Yeah. Oh, you see that uh, just from the cases presented today that it's always not just an orthopedic bank or repair to do what you need. Uh, so you got to, you got to just like those cases demonstrate, you, you identify what's the pathology, bone, soft tissue, ligaments, tendons, and then address them. And that's how you get the successes, you know, it's no cookie cutter, you know, you design that operation to that specific patient and use all the information you've got, the patient's complaints, the preoperative studies, um, what their disabilities are. Just to make the game plan. That's cool. Great. Well, it's been a lot of fun for me. I've enjoyed being here. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah. Great. Great job, guys. Great conference. Thanks, Javier. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Spiro.
phone call should actually break down. Oh, really? Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Where are you applying now? She's at a, she's oh, applying next year. Yeah. Next year and then uh, yeah. Run okay. William right now is applying to you or Run is applying to Shoal Noble right now. So where where are you looking at? Where are you like the I have been dislocated for over here. I don't understand Washington. Maybe, sure. uh, you know, they're, you know, because um, who is it? Who runs it now? It's the uh, uh, 